Uh, painting is a materials-based activity, and its history shows that the production of a painting is a tough and revealing enterprise that tests the ability of the of artist to create something that transmits ideas using a non-verbal form of communication. Painting is an art that is expected to be new. It is expected to be different, questioning, beautiful, cutting edge, timeless, provocative, and possibly many, many things more. The fact that painting has met all of these expectations over the past centuries make it a significant factor in human culture. Yet, in the last century, painting has been declared dead at least three times. The invention of photography, the idea of the ready-made, and conceptualism each provided reasons for the demise of painting. But it has not perished. That's why we are here today. It is alive because of a public and a professional research interest into how a painting comes into being and what it could mean. It is alive because painting exists to be experienced. It is an instrument through which we recognize our humanity, but really, the question hangs over our heads, what is painting today? What is different about painting now to what it was just half a century ago? Two inescapable facts confront everyone who loves to paint. The first is that it will always be an object. It will always be an object, it will be a thing with a material presence and a hypervisuality. And its object nature and visual scope make it a conduit for questions about the world. Paintings never are purely conceptual in the manner that they communicate without reference to their physical form. Even paintings concerned with the very high point of abstraction, the void, are objects. To truly engage with the nature and scope of painting, we have to look at the painted object in close up. We have to share a space with it and relate its size to that of our own bodies, etc. And a reproduction of a painting, of course, can never stand in for this objective experience. Secondly, painting cannot reveal time in the manner it's this digital age commands that we see. It can never be time-based in the sense of real-time sequencing. It is a slow medium, a very slow medium, when it comes to time. And this apparent inability to transmit information in milliseconds and via the World Wide Web is often misunderstood as an absence of postmodern intellectual conviction. In an era concerned more with pixels, performance, and printed text, painting has remained, by and large, a medium that uses color pigment bound up in oil or acrylic, and by layering these mixtures in thin or heavy deposits onto a support, the painter builds an image that connects and communicates with us through its own particular language. It takes time to make a painting, and the viewer needs to spend time with it. So, how can painting translate or even interrogate the issues of our rapid, globally networked age with any immediacy? How can we learn from it when its languages appear to be behind the time and constantly changing? Little in art today, of course, is precise or immediate or coherent. To address painting with expectation that it radically changes its character and adjusts itself to our present sense of time flies in the face of reality. The viewer's relationship to culture resembles something like a journey. It's about arriving somewhere at a point in time or place to which they can return again and again. And for viewers confused about contemporary arts, relation to their own notion of culture, painting's objective nature once again appears to be more real than anything else in the visual field. And that is why so many people are returning to painting. 
the fast moving real time imagery that runs us off our feet and into a cul de sac or an emotional cul de sac has one believing that the issues of our age is one of speed, not sensory engagement. The shifts and displacement instant imaging passes on to us constructs a sense of belonging to nothing, to no place in particular, or to no particular cultural space. Art that leaves little or no trace of itself in space seems to be less satisfactory to the viewer. It is not puzzling, therefore, that the vast majority of visitors to museums and galleries want to see painting, because it triggers processes of cognition and emotion that return them to a place or a point in time that agitates emotions and ruffles their humanity. Painting can conjure images of things that are unrepresentable, such as the cosmos, humanity, I suppose a nation, warmth, cold, what Leotard calls negative representation. It is perhaps the reason why painting more readily than other media becomes timeless or admired way beyond its time. A painting is therefore a catalyst for thought and unlike the media of film and video or photography, its catalytic effect is slow, sometimes turgid, but nonetheless profound. It can simultaneously bring to mind the spirit and the emotion of a recent occurrence and retrieve memories from the deepest recesses of the mind. It can even provide a vision. And this remarkable ability to simultaneously memorize and predict using mostly signs that are not words makes painting memorable, makes it timeless, makes it evocative in a manner that other media struggles or actually do not achieve. So with the invention of photography, painting is said to have surrendered its documentary function and painters no longer needed to paint the world as it appears. Painting's imagery needed only to reference reality through psychological associations, poetic inference, sensory or spiritual sensation. Paintings became signs, metaphors and symbols that pointed to appearances, not appearances themselves. The encounter of manographic marks on a painted surface results in an interaction with our psychic, semiotic, poetic and emotional sensitivities. A painting's color, its light and its scale, the viscosity of the painterly materials can agitate our senses. Everyone who loves painting experiences that. In the last century, painting was regarded as a medium for visionary interpretations of the world. But in a cultural discourse concerned with rational fact, painting's metaphysical truth appeared tangen tangential or suspect. Western modernism's restless search for alternative forms of visual representation declared painting a weak communicative force. Metaphoric and poetic imagery simply lacked the Sachlichkeit of a postmodern art. Photography, film and video had this Sachlichkeit in abundance and painting didn't. Now one can describe painting as a weak force but one similar to gravity. And its weakness can easily be demonstrated by using something like a fridge magnet to lift a small metal object off the ground, thereby breaking the pull of gravity uh, on that object. But because gravity acts on all particles that have mass and over great distance, its overall effect is considerable and therefore very powerful indeed. It actually holds our universe together. Painting as our oldest form of nonverbal communication is existential, everyone says that. Its languages act like a form of glue that hold things together of value for the individual. But it can easily be separated from life when other forms of art act as the arbiters of a new fridge magnet truth. 
So the search for postmodern alternatives to painting in the middle of the 20th century shifted our focus to performance, conceptualism, and installation art. And many painters felt pressured to conform and to make paintings with social and societal comments or contexts. Minimalism and conceptualism cut a pathway away from art crafted by the hand towards one in which art was crafted by the mind. Paintings had to be clear statements about something meaningful to its time. The visual experience of painting became a narrative one. Metaphor was replaced with fact and poetry with journalism. And this late modernist transformation of art from visual to literal did, did connect popular culture to high art, making art more democratic, I suppose, which I suppose is the great achievement of pop art and not of painting. But this literal connection was an attempt to transform the very genes of painting's DNA. So the success of, West, of painting in Western European modernism and the brazen chauvinism of the institutions and individuals that lent this painting a support made painters believe that their medium could both absorb the effects and the alternative strategies of the new technologies without ever altering painting's DNA or its canonical status. The interrogation of the, and the recoding of Western modernism enveloped painting's most essential doctrines in doubt. Its chauvinism was debunked and its role in visual culture ceased to be taken for granted. And even though new expressionist painters in Germany managed to sustain painting's presence uh, in art discourses via its subject and context at the very close of the 20th century, the rhetoric of postmodern of postmodernism privileged other forms of art with the zeitgeist of the approaching 22nd century. As the doubt about painting became more opaque, it appeared less strategic, it appeared less relevant, and certainly less attractive. But in truth, though, the strongest criticism of painting during this period focused on Western European abstract or non-figurative painting. These terms are interchangeable and understood slightly differently in wherever you use them. It's it was this association of non-figurative and abstract painting with high modernism that really was the focus of the criticism. Paintings interrogators preferred to point to abstract painting more often than to things like printmaking or sculpture or even drawing or photography. Abstraction became equated with the erasure of content. And because it apparently contained no societal, political, and cultural context or subjects, abstraction equaled no subject. So painting's claim of being both the standard bearer of internationalism, however you understand that, and democracy, however you understand that, was dubious because its most lauded practitioners were by and large white men from two regions of the world, the USA and Western Europe. And worst of all, painting's lofty assumptions of being esoteric associated it with the excesses of capitalism as the prices for paintings soared with the economic boom of the 70s and the 80s, painting became regarded as nothing more than an instrument for chauvinism, imperialism, and bourgeois taste. The theories in support of abstract painting were regarded as retrograde and even sentimental litanies by the close of the 20s. 20th century. International art biennales showed fewer paintings, and over the first two decades of the new century, installation, video, photography, and performance art blossomed instead. There's a little fact I just want to point out to you. I've just written it down here in my notes. It said, um, 
the Whitney Biennale, famed for its experimentation, etc. The last one in 2012 showed 50 artists. Only five of them were painters. So museums exhibited few living, fewer and fewer living painters and satisfied their visitors with spectacular blockbuster presentations of work by old, often dead, masters of modernism. Good as these review exhibitions were, they nonetheless underlined the notion that painting in the first decade of the new millennium had become an art with very few engaging contemporary examples and lacking theoretical texts to secure its autonomy in the broad sphere of contemporary art practice. After one of his recent lectures, our dear Robert Storr, who is not with us, was asked by a student of painting what one needs to do to secure painting's future. In fact, this question came up yesterday and got a very similar answer. Robert simply replied, make a better painting. The student sat down and must have been, like the rest of his colleagues in the room, thinking to himself, better than what? Uh, <laughs> and um, better than the last good painting, and when was that? And why was it good then? But this rapid decline in the hierarchy of contemporary art practice just over the last half century provide lessons that I think can help artists make a better painting. And of course, we cannot talk about contemporary painting or painting's future without referencing its past. But dwelling on the past alone will not lift the shadow of doubt from painting. Neither will the re resurrection or resuscitation of Greenberg's theory help. Painting does not need another canonical text, not one as heavy as Greenberg. And a theoretical repast to painting's detractors alone creates a conundrum that invalidates the whole undertaking of making a better painting because it would give the written word supremacy over the visual. And it is this shift from the narrative back to the visual that I feel will strengthen painting's autonomy. Painting must be seen making its case in the contemporary visual field in order for any text to sustain its progress. Making a better painting is the construction, in fact, of signposts and pathways that lead those who love painting out of the fog of doubt. The doubt about painting's relevance in contemporary culture has made the artist and the viewer's engagement with, 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 with painting acts of ambivalence. To paint in the face of doubt is indeed a brave act, perhaps a revolutionary act, in current theoretical times. It is full of risk for the painter who cannot trust only him or herself in the search for clarity. Painters have no assurances that the myriad phenomenological and cognitive signposts they create, that this will cre uh, guide a public out of this fog and guide them out of the fog themselves. But the attempt alone will help to explain why painting has outlived all the pronouncements of its death. Painters today are concerned with renewal, and therefore are more inclined to consolidate the surviving conventions of modernist painting than to attempt to invent something absolutely radically new. It's not that invention is too risky, but that radical newness has become a pastiche. It's a trait of modernism, of the old desire to reinvent everything. The viewer, on the other hand, has to trust what they see before they accept what they read about painting. Looking is still the primary method of validation. Words do not help. 
but they always, because they always struggle to capture the full nature of the, visu of the viewer's close up and immediate experience with painting. And those who love painting know that the, con the conversation between the painter and the viewer, with the painting as conduit, is the essential experience of the engagement with this medium. So when painting goes beyond the category of surface qualities and appearances, words genuinely begin to fail. And therefore, you have to trust what you see. So sometimes this conversation between painter and viewer is a polite, refined and pleasant one. Other times it's a raging argument. But the upfront face-to-face -face engagement sharpens focus. It evaporates doubt when the conversation's attention is on painting and not its alignment to a theoretical position. Its social context or its economic value are also things we should not focus on first. Viewers would, for example, like to maybe discuss someone like Ensel, Kiefer's use of painterly material, his ability to create evocative surfaces, his color sense, the impressions he conjures up before they talk about his address of German mythology or Nazi fascism or, in fact, the price his work gets in the auction houses around the world. So painting is currently, for me, at an interregnum and it is kept in the stasis with ambivalence on the one side and trust on the other. But they are always small, or they are already, I would say, small incremental shifts that tilt away from ambivalence towards trust. And our appetite for painting is exactly one of them. Another example is how artists no longer delineate, delineate them, their method of production as was common just years ago. It was symptomatic of the 70s as the identity of painters began to dissipate into the fog of doubt, that they began to refer to themselves in the generic term first. I am an artist, followed by the discipline, who paints. This absence of a clear identity then moved the student of art away from painting to more familiar and liberal melding of the old and new forms into this term we called art practice. Today, and without hesitation, many artists, both young and old, identify themselves as painters, upholding the autonomy of painting even when their practice is not limited to just this one discipline or field. So I asked myself, what would be some ideas to create a better painting. I've come up with a number. The first one I would say is that the first goal of painting in the face of doubt is to increase its presence and amplify its voice within cultural discourse while avoiding the dictamies of abstraction versus figuration or art for art's sake versus art for life's sake both attitudes inscribe painting as existential in culture. Both positions have helped to formulate the ethics and aesthetics of painting. By accepting these divergences and acknowledging what painting has achieved in spite of the contradicting positions within it, one creates a new starting point to talk and experience painting. Secondly, today there, the case for painting as an autonomous uh, discipline is made against a very broad theoretical assertion that anything can be art. The challenge of postmodern theory tempted painters to experiment with the medium in order to keep it aligned to this postmodern idea. Their experiments often resembled a snake eating its own tail. In a vicious self-assessment, painting appeared to gobble its own history along with its moral and ethical codes. It recreated itself without synaptic links to its past, and from once being a medium that could address events of significance, painting appeared to become superficial 
cynical, irresponsible, even amoral. Anything could be a painting, or a painting could be anything, as long as it included a postmodern theoretical appendage. Accepting that anything goes blurs the distinction of what is good about painting and what is not. The divide between quality and the lack of it grows ever smaller as more and more things are declared painting, leaving a little room at this interstice for the best in painting to assert itself. To extract something good from the array of experiments made with painting and without painting now requires the connoisseurship that resembles a surgeon with a finely pointed forceps trying to extract from the body of painting its good ideas or separate out dubious ethics or incompetent craft. If one believes that anything goes and painting should let go of the things that make it good, the viewer's broad grasp of painting goes with it and confusion grows, and there's enough of that already in the art world. Viewers will need keener eyes to see through the camouflage of scale, spectacle, or the broad brush strokes of serendipity that theory credits as painting. Many young student painters will come to believe in the adage that if you can't make it good, make it big. If you can't make it big, make it red. So should painters fail to qualify what the disciplines of painting are or have become and cannot show and cannot tell what painting is, their lack of assurance infers an acceptance of the proposition that anything goes, that anything can be called a painting. And the task of the road signs out of the fog of doubt may have to begin with stating the obvious, namely that a painting is an object manifest through its use of paint and that painting is a medium invented for the transfiguration of ideas into viewable objects or tangible objects in the world. There is a skill in making this transfiguration appear and it resides in the manipulation of painterly materials. Thirdly, I think contemporary painters are not anti-theoretical, but they certainly are more retinal. Relying on the visual encoding of the paint deposit on its support more than its theoretical alignment to a popular discourse or theoretical position. Painters are learning to suspend theory, to set it aside if it gets in the way of making a painting uh, or making a painted image, and they will return to a theoretical position once the painting is done. Repetition has remained a vital part of the painting, of the practice of painting, because it has led to discovery. There are no set theories or rules about this. It's just, that empirical, it's just a form of empirical discovery that actually is added on to history. Scientific research employs strategies of repetition to test and validate assumptions and in that way to secure new discoveries. Trial and error is a proven strategy that actually gets results. And even when the painter does not know exactly what he or she is doing in the studio. Repeating paintings conventions, testing its affirmation again and again will appear nostalgic, but it will appear nostalgic only if repetition does not have the aspiration and the intention to discover, to disclose, and to disseminate. Repeating something overlooked in painting's cavernous history can establish signposts out of the fog of doubt. Another goal is the enjoyment of painting and enjoying the many mysteries that come to fore when a manographic deposit of paint on a surface agitates our centers and senses. 
For paintings to harbor the zeitgeist of our current digitally networked century, its practitioners have to become brazen about their conviction that a painted image resonates meaning through the very slow, catalytic processes of looking and learning with the eyes. Painting hardly ever concerns itself with the instant replay of reality or the rapid exchange of information. Painting's attraction is that it functions like a jetty at the edge of a sea of knowledge. It creates a vantage point from which the viewer's gaze can scan the metaphysical. It marks the departure point of a calm and thoughtful journey into the unknown that opens a new experience and that in turn alters awareness. Then there's the question of innovation. Innovation and revision have endowed painting with a sense of aesthetics. Some would say bourgeois aesthetics. But within this aesthetic realm, there remains valid notions of skill and craft that are regarded as vital to any painter's prospect to innovate and deconstruct the very traditions and the very convention of painting itself. Bad, pan, bad painting cannot debunk good painting by simply claiming that it is doing it. The deliberate negation of painting's former qualities needs the painter to be familiar with those qualities to be able to manhandle them as a style. Painting's narrative is infused with notions of morality and purpose. And painting is loved because it has never been afraid of testing its very own limits. Its record of innovative change prepared viewers for those great leaps into the unknown that other, more recent forms of art have actually done by following painting's example. And so even today, painting still appears as the media best able to stride out from the fog of postmodern doubt because of its history of fearless, even reckless, leaps into the unknown. And that is perhaps why we are witnessing more students studying it than over the last 20 years, and more exhibitions of contemporary painting in museums and galleries. Just to remind you, the city of Berlin yesterday opened a series of exhibitions, I forget the title, somebody may know it in the audience, there are something like 19 galleries opened in Berlin last night with a focus on painting. And those exhibitions will stand for the next two months. So one city, certainly in Europe, is taking this address of painting very seriously. So if photography, the ready-made, and conceptualism were not accessories to the attempted death of painting, they did pressure painting to consider where it was going. Photography forced painting into working with new pictorial space that was not an optical trick on the canvas, but an idea in the mind of the viewer, placed there by the association of forms on a picture plane. Painting could be of itself, as it made painters consider painting's formal qualities, its use of shape, color, scale, together with the visceral effect of, paint, of the paint deposit to create a sense of reality that would leak from the canvas. The push in the US, in particular, towards pure abstraction in the 1950s, really split paintings along the notions of illusion on the one hand and allusion on the other. Some painters wanted the medium to remain representational, despite the invention of photography, and the medium should, in fact, continue to describe the world and rely on its wondrous ability to fake three-dimensional space with linear perspective. In short, they really wanted painting to stand in for the real, to prove that painting and history are old friends that meet at the threshold of the imagination.
The movement away from figuration, on the other hand, wanted painting to become a sustained experiment that moved towards an ever greater abstraction and eventually the void. That's what the Rothko experiment was about, I suppose. Similar to scientific, to scientists in, in search for a new subatomic particle that would explain all of creation, the incremental refinement of painting's formal material and the subjective aspects would reveal the very essence of the medium. It could make painting become an art with no evident content, yet somehow full of it. So making a bait better painting will, of course, produce works of art that can disrupt the digital and automated ways of looking without seeing in our networked world. The fearless painter will insert painting's ethics and aesthetics like a virus into the circuits of our pixelated world. And it, come, and it can become a tool that investigates the very nature of perception. It can become a boulder in the road. It can become a disruption to the discourses, as Mary Slotley said yesterday, a disruption to the discourses of our time. By renewing painting's vocabulary of signs, looking at the paintings of tomorrow should challenge the knowledge system of factual recording of real-time replay and of digital streaming. The signposts now under construction will re-establish the psychic, the semiotic relationships between the viewer and painted objects. Painting will again ask for something none of us give up easily. It will ask for your precious time in order to make spaces in your lives for the calm contemplation of those things we see but cannot yet fully understand. And to satisfy our appetite for painting, we will give painting what it asks. Thank you. I kind of wanted to get back at something you mentioned yesterday about translators, about painters being translators. Yeah. Um, and want to know what you think about it. Uh, you were mentioning the psychic and sort of, oh wait, about Se painting, yeah, semiotic sort of engagement that it is. Mm -hmm. And um, it made me really think about what James Elkins wrote about painting being liquid thought, kind mm -hmm. of, which the way you were talking about it really made me think about that. And I was wondering, as to what, in what sense do you see painters then as translators? I, I think when I think about painters as translators, I don't think of them as... I think of those people who sit at the United Nations and take Russian and translate it into Japanese or English or whatever the case may be. Um, I think the translation element is a much broader thing than just taking a simple line of thought and putting it forward in another language, in another form. It's not that simple. It was as if you are translating it into every possible language, into every possible way you can think. So I don't, I don't see painters as a, kind of, as a kind of singular task of saying, this has been said, and now I'm making it and saying it in this other language. That's not really. It's just, I, I have an idea, and an idea is, three-dimensional and there's all these possibilities and I'll give you maybe some of them or some I'll put all of them into one concrete work which is, which is what painters try to do certainly when they believed and thought that painting was this phenomenal medium that could do everything and could you know, beat every other kind of form of art practice. Uh, and of course we've discovered that that's not the case, that other forms of art practice also have their qualities and bring substantial um, pieces of insight and information about the world to the viewer. So the translation aspect is, is much more complicated than just a simple manual task of referring it from one to another. I'm here as a painter and uh, teacher of art. And um, so I'm glad you said uh, you mentioned other art here. But earlier on you said that 
You mentioned um, this notion of anything goes in contemporary art. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Anything goes, anything goes in yeah. contemporary art. Mm. I kind of want to take issue with that a little yes. bit. <laughs> Certainly. Because I think that many people think that. Mm -hmm. But I think that it's the problem of all artists to negotiate against that belief that now all art is about anything goes. And yes. it's not just the issue of painting. No, it's not just an issue of painting. I think in our, in, in our specific field, it, it's drama dramatized for the simple reason that painters have kind of let go of certain beliefs that they have uh, and accepted the fact that you can, I can take this up and, and put it on a shelf and say that is a painting. Why is that a painting? I think the fact that you, I, feel, I believe that one of the reasons painting has lost this, uh, its former recognition, put it that way, broadly speaking, is the fact that we have not qualified what it is a painting does and what a painting could possibly be. I'm not limiting that to any particular style or form. I'm just saying that I don't get a sense from painters or from any discourses about painting that actually is actually resisting this very act of uh, accepting that anything goes. That artists are actually saying, no, there is a line that I will not cross and I will not allow you to cross to call this a painting. I actually do want to call this particular thing a painting and that thing I want to call something else. And I accept both of them in the world of artistic discourse. But this definitely is a painting and that is not a painting. I stand for that, yes. It's a conservative perhaps position, mm -hmm. but I do believe that the reason we do not make that claim is the reason that somebody can come in and you know, throw a bucket of paint in the air and say, that's a painting. And I don't accept that.